I'm, I'm going to speak about some of the personal experiences uh, around kind of Erlang and Elixir and a journey which I've kind of undertaken, which has kind of taken me 20 years to go in and actually realize uh, why, um, why, you know, the tools we are using uh, are perfect you know, for both scalability, but also for resilience. Um, you know, if you go back to my early days at the computer science laboratory, even, yeah, we had Joe Armstrong uh, going around and telling everyone, oh, Erlang's great, Erlang's, you know, you, you use Erlang, your systems will scale and your systems will never fail. And I think all of us kind of kept on repeating it, uh, but never really quite understanding why. Uh, Joe's very good at spreading enthusiasm and, and that, that, that's what he managed to do. But it took me having to write two books and, um, and about 20 years of, of, of working with the technology to really understand the true secret of it and, and why it's scalable and, resili and, and resilient. And now hopefully, yeah, with you sitting in today, uh, you won't have to undertake the same journey and you can take some shortcuts and, and learn from my lessons. Now, how many of you, uh, yeah, you can go in and kind of, uh, uh, you should be able to raise your hands here. How many of you have actually uh, used functional programming on a daily basis? Just a, 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 as a, as a uh, count of hands. So quite, quite, quite a few of you do. That's great. And for me, you know, I first came across functional programming in 1991. And uh, it was in 1991. I was studying computer science. And uh, I really, really enjoyed it. We had to write a little program. Uh, which you know allowed us to uh, allowed us to find an exit in a maze, but it wasn't until a few years later uh, when um, uh, you know where the real first major interaction with functional programming came about, and it was in my parallel computing course uh, at Uppsala University. Uh, the lecturer came in and waved the very first edition of. Um, a concurrent programming in Erlang, which you see on the bottom right. And actually, one of the co-authors is actually listening in on this talk. So that's kind of cool of that book. Um, and so, so your lecturer came in and waved the book and said, read it. And then after that, he waved some printouts, which you know, these are the exercises, do them. And when he did, off he went and started to lecture to us about the horrors of parallel programming. So he was lecturing about deadlocks. He was lecturing about mutexes, about semaphores, corrupt memory, and you know, things which us as very young kind of programmers were really uh, scared. Yeah, we, we were scared. We were worried. Oh, wow, yeah, this is hard stuff. Yet I then started doing the exercises. And what we had to do is we had to create a virtual world where we had carrot patches growing. And then with the carrot patches, we had rabbits walking around this virtual world, which would go in and eat the carrots. And if the rabbits were greedy and ate a lot of carrots, they'd get fat and they'd split in two. If they didn't eat enough carrots, uh, the energy would go down to zero, they would die. Uh, the rabbits also communicated with each other. So they would go in and say, hey, I found carrots here because obviously rabbits are social animals they like to share. So, hey, I've got carrots here. And all the rabbits would go in and you know give the position and go in and start eating the carrots. And um, we also though had wolves roaming uh, this virtual world and wolves obviously went out and hunted for rabbits. So if a rabbit uh, saw a wolf, they'd shout wolf to all the other rabbits within a certain, and they'd all run away. And if a wolf saw a rabbit, it would shout rabbit to all the other wolves. And they'd, so they'd all communicate that way. And the goal was to create a balanced world. And you know, the, the way I designed it was you know, every rabbit, every carrot patch was a process, every rabbit was a process, every wolf, uh, every wolf was a process. And it, it, you know, it took me about 40 hours to do. And at the time, you know, we were using in university deck workstations. Uh, the operating system handled, you know, if I remember correctly, about 16 threads. So we could have you know, 16 tasks actually happening in, in, in parallel. And I remember going in and typing PS minus EF, you know, expecting 
to see a process for every uh, for every rabbit, a thread for every rabbit, for every wolf, you know. And yeah, there, there were probably you know, 20, 30 rabbits and wolves and, and so on, you know, running. Yeah, I think you know, when we started hitting about 100, 150, that's when everything started stalling. And despite that, I remember you know, PS minus CF and only seeing one pro well, two pro two, two threads from my program. One was the jam, which was uh, you know, the, the, the predecessor of the beam, Joe's abstract machine which you know, we used for quite a while. And the other was the Tickle TK uh, front end uh, thread, which handled all of the visualization of what we were doing. So really, really impressed. But what also impressed me was that none of what, none of the horrors which the lecture was talking about actually materialized. We had no deadlocks, we had no corrupt memory. Uh, we didn't have to implement any mutexes. Um, and yeah, much later, I actually went in and realized that you know, when the lecturer was lecturing to us about the horrors of, of parallel programming, he was talking about a model based on mutable state, uh, you know, based on threads, uh, based on shared memory, but also based on locks. And what we were using, uh, you know, with Erlang was, uh, was a concurrency model based on immutable states where we've got processes, uh, processes don't share memory and they communicate with, with, with each other through message passing. And, and that was the huge difference uh, over what actually stopped us you know, from, from seeing a lot of those horrors. Now, just a little warning here. Uh, I think I will come clean uh, because if I don't, I mean, I'm sure someone will go into my Twitter feed and, and, and debunk me, but uh, I have actually tweeted this uh, 11th of September about 12 years ago. Don't use the word immutable. They might ask you what it means. And um, yeah, so I'll flash the tweet because yeah, you will uh, if I don't, but you know, what is immutability? You know, go back to the time when you were studying differential equations. It could be algebra in high school, or if you were fortunate enough to study lambda calculus or, or, or geometry, this is what they taught us in school, if you remember. They taught us that y is equal to x squared minus one. Now, then all of a sudden, they start teaching us to program. And when they start teaching us to program, this is what they tell us to do instead. x is equal to x squared minus one. And whilst this was completely unacceptable and yeah, and defined kind of the laws of physics, you know, to quote Joe Armstrong, uh, you know, back in, back in high school, when we started programming, it became acceptable. And becoming acceptable, I think, you know, at least if you look at the Erlang philosophy, you know, this is wrong uh, because what you're doing all of a sudden is not, you're not solving an equation anymore as you are right here. What you're doing is you're mutating the value of x, you're actually changing that value. And what you do is when you mutate something, you change some parts of it, you change some parts of that component, but you keep the common bits. And, and this approach, if you think of it, goes head to head with immutable state, where you share you know, what you can copy. You share what you can copy, and you copy what you can share uh, almost sounds like a paradox, but, but think about it. Uh, so, and, and this whole notion of immutability has been part of, of kind of the functional programming world forever. You know, it, it's been something which in the very, very early days of functional programming was actually there. Um, I first came across it, you know, going back in the, the history with Miranda, but I mean, it, it was there even before Miranda. And how does that apply to, to concurrency? Well, you've got a process and only the process itself can go in and mutate its state. Other processes can't go in and change its state. And that's what we mean about immutable uh, concurrency models. Are, are you following me here? Is that okay? Yeah. So, So 
let, let's take a few steps back and actually compare th these concurrency models based on mutable and immutable states. Now, what happens if you've got basically a mutable state, a concurrency model based on mutable state, and your program crashes when executing in the critical section? Okay, what happens if your program crashes when you're executing in the critical section? Well, you don't know what state your, uh, you know, you don't know what state the shared memory was left in. Because this process, this thread here was actually manipulating some shared memory. And by the default, that means that you need to go in and terminate all threads which have access to this shared memory. Because they might all be affected and then recreate all of these threads and recreate, try to recreate that state with a shared memory. Does that make sense? <laughs> so your second problem when, uh, when you're dealing with mutable state. Now assume you've got a, uh, a process running in London, in the UK, and you've got another process running in Melbourne, in Australia. Typical problem of distributed systems. Where you locate your shared memory. How many of you have flown? Well, yeah, I, I, okay. I've flown from, from London to, 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 to Melbourne three times and you can't do it in one go. The distance is too big. It's a 24 hour flight. So what you do is you actually need to land somewhere. So very common place to land is Dubai. So let's, let's assume you know, we, we, we place our shared memory in the Arab Emirates, right? That's great. We shared it in our Arab, 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 Arab Emirates. Now, now what, happens what happens if your network connection goes down? And it's not if your network connection goes down, but when your network connection goes down. Uh, because yeah, the, the, the only, yeah, as, as I've said before, there are only three certainties in life. There are, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's taxes, death, and network partitions. So when your network connection goes down, you all of a sudden cannot access your shared memory. You've got a problem. So the shared memory mutability will work and will work really well and will be really fast, but only if it's on a single machine and assuming nothing goes wrong. So let's look at the mutable state now. Um, let's look at the mutable state. Now, all of a sudden, what happens if your state gets corrupted and a process track crashes? Nothing, because when the process terminates, you clear the state. That process, below, that, that state belongs only to that particular process. That process is terminated, you clear the state. It's a whole let it crash philosophy, which we have, you know, in the Erlang world, which was then taken over by Scala and Akka, Elixir and others. Um, we want, you know, if, if the memory in, in a process is corrupt, you know, it's only that process which gets affected. So let's not try to fix it. Let's terminate that process and restart. You know, other processes will go in and they'll have their own copy of the data. So they can just continue executing. They don't need to terminate it. They, they, can, they can just continue executing. Now, what about locality with immutable state? We've got a process running in London, one running in Melbourne. You do not locate state, you copy it. So if the network goes down, if the network goes down, London will have its own copy of the data. Melbourne will have its own copy of the data and they'll continue running. You know? And I think what you need to think about, however, is when the network comes, does come back up, you will need to allow your data to somehow converge back to a consistent state. You know, and, and for that, you know, we're, we're um, you know, we're using, you know, there are tools or libraries or databases which allow us to do it. You know, we've got databases which allow causal and eventual consistency. Uh, we can use CRDTs 
and we can also you know allow uh, this convergence you know to happen on the business layer in, in some cases you know in, in your code itself in some cases it makes sense to do it that way am i making sense are you following me here yeah great thanks so I have to say, I appreciate you having your cameras on. It makes it so much easier you know, to, to actually see faces um, and, and see interactions. And the best part is actually seeing you laugh at all my bad jokes. So that's, <laughs> uh, so good, good, good. So um, now let, let's step back a, a second right here because I use the terms mutable and immutable state. And what I mean by mutable and immutable state, concurrency models based on mutable and immutable state is, that it's a model um, based on shared memory and no shared memory. And so no matter you know, what it is you're using, I think the right approach is always to, to e even if you've got a, an, an approach based on shared memory, is to try to keep the immutability within a thread or a process and let these threads or processes behave as immutable data structures. And you know, I, I would actually recommend you to go in and Google talks by Martin Thompson. Uh, he is he, he's a brilliant programmer. Um, we've spoken at many conferences together uh, and he works with the JVM. And his, his goal is you know, to really get the JVM to execute incredibly fast, you know, and, 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 and for speed. And what he does is he achieves the speed, uh, uh, achieves both scale and throughput on the JVM by describing the techniques of, you know, by, by using the techniques I've just described. You go in and listen to Martin's talks. What he's doing is he's applying functional programming techniques to Java, to Java threads, where each thread basically becomes immutable. It only mutates its own data and there's no shared memory. So he, he, he addresses all of these issues that way. So let's take it a step further. Uh, let's think of distribution. Now, all of a sudden, if we've got concurrency based on immutable state, that leads us into distribution because what distribution does is it will abstract away uh, from where things are. Hmm? You're getting cold. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you could please mute, yeah. So, um, so what it does is distribution, you know, will allow us to, to abstract away from things that are executed. And, and what happens here is we've got processes and if processes don't share memory, we can have a process in Australia, we can have a process in the UK. By default, you know, we get distribution. So by abstracting away from um, where things are distributed, you know, you start thinking in terms of one single computation, you know, that's going to slow everything down because if we've got a computation in London, which then gets placed in Melbourne, we have latency. You know, it takes a few milliseconds for, um, for a request to reach Melbourne. We need to compute it in a few milliseconds back. It slows it down, but it will slow down one computation. When you're doing multiple computations in parallel, you'll actually speed things up. So in this particular case, you know, we're parallelizing five computations so, you know, if we add the latency, all of a sudden, latency starts becoming irrelevant because it will add a few milliseconds, but this few milliseconds will be added all, only once. The computations themselves will go five times faster. Am I making sense here? Are you following me? Right. So, and, and there are also cases, and there's a lot of research happening right now, you know, when latency does matter, locality and affinity become key. Uh, and, and this is also where edge computing, you know, comes in, into place, you know, where do we actually execute? Do we execute, you know, in the edge network? Do we execute in the cloud network? Uh, or, you know, do we make that decision, you know, uh, at runtime based on, based on the actual latency? So let me quickly step forward. Um, yeah, higher order functions are another great thing, um, another great kind of construct from functional programming, which makes you know these abstractions work because what it does it gives you the scaffolding and the infrastructure 
in your concurrence and distribution framework. Uh, what you do is you map your, your functionality in, in enclosures, which, uh, which can then be shifted around. Um, in one of the areas where I'm seeing this, you're being used a lot today, is around big data. You know, every year we're collecting more data than all of the previous years put together. And there's so much data which we need to review that, you know, the, you know pushing the data to the compute, to the computer to get it analyzed becomes too expensive. We want to analyze the data at the source. So what we're doing is we're moving the compute to the data. And the compute might vary from one time to another. And so that's what we're doing, you know, through, through, um, through, uh, uh, through, through uh, closures. So uh, it works because you have local, local data, which again, you're not sharing immutability. Um, you know, um, you know, think, you know, you know, I think, you know, this is the Elixir meetup. So think of Elixir pipes, think where data is passed from one function to another and mutate in the process. It's mutated in these functions themselves and not outside of that process itself. This is another typical example of where we're heading. So uh, these, uh, this is you know, kind of relatively old hardware, but you know, both you know, Raspberry Pi and parallel boards, they're both about the size of a credit card. On the left, uh, the parallel board, uh, it's got a dual core ARM processor and an epiphany chip. An epiphany chip has a 16 or 64 core coprocessor as well as an FPGA. Uh, they, they were uh, created by a company called Adaptiva. They've now pivoted, but you know, from what I hear, they're still selling, uh, selling quite a few. And what about $100 was basically able to give you a, a compute module with 64 cores. What really blew my mind is that um, the parallel board actually consumed four to six watts of energy. So you had 64 cores consuming just a few watts of energy, less than a light bulb. And you know the Raspberry Pi on the right-hand side, it actually got its coprocessor, its quad-core processor in 2015. So it became multi-core in 2015. You know, go back, you know, to the 80s, you know, Cray 2 was a supercomputer back in the 80s. And, you know, the first iPhones had more computing power than, you know, supercomputers back then. Yeah. And wh why am I saying all of this? Well, take uh, Fujitsu's Fugaku uh, computer. It's, at least last time I checked, it was the fastest supercomputer in the world. They keep on, you know, they keep on, um, you know, outbidding each other. And uh, so this supercomputer has a total of 158,976 nodes. And each node has a total of 52 cores. Uh, so put together all of that, you know, what you end up getting is something like 415 petaflop operations per second. Now, what is a petaflop operation? Well, it's about a quadrillion operations per second. And a quadrillion is somewhere between a trillion and a quintillion. So it's a heck of a lot of operations. And what the Fugaku and the Raspberry Pi have in common is the whole notion of heterogeneous multicore. So they have basically many different types of cores. You know, it's not just the same um, homogeneous core. They've got heterogeneous cores. And you think of future hardware architectures, um, you know, they will have you know, CPUs, they will have uh, GPUs, they will have graphic cores, heavyweight CPUs, lightweight integer units, DSPs, your cores for your securities, NOx, so networks on chips, IO and soft cores, um, which is basically what, you know, it, it, it's the post FPGA. Uh, and, you know, like it or not, the whole shift you know, to multi-core is inevitable. And I don't know how many of you have tried to do it, but I've seen a lot of really, really good developers hit their head against a wall really hard because trying to parallelize legacy C and Java is very, very hard. Um, debugging parallelized C and Java is even harder. And to start dealing with things like that in these days, 
you know, you need to ask yourselves, you know, what is the appropriate technology? What is the right approach? What is the appropriate technology to do that? And, you know, we've heard stories of Erlang and Elixir code being taken from, you know, from, uh, you know, running from a dual core machine onto a quad core machine. And just by recompiling the code, it would run twice as fast. You know, go from a quad core machine to 32 cores. All of a sudden, you know, you should be able to get an almost eight fold increase in throughput. <laughs> and, and that's because, you know, we've got the whole programming model based on it. We, we, we've been using the right programming model, which is a concurrency model based on non mutable state, based on immutable state where each process will run on different types of cores. And we'll then leave it to the underlying VM to deal with the scheduling, to deal with the utilization, to deal with you know, a better understanding over what these cores do. So we're abstracting all of this away from the programmer. So we have programmers don't need to worry about NOx and you know, IO and soft cores and lightweight integer units. The VM will do it for us. All we need to do as programmers is think in terms of concurrency, think in terms of immutable state and, and processes based on immutable state. And that's really what makes it so much easier for us. And you know, if we look at a tweet from, again, 2015, so it's seven years old now, you know, from Andreas Ulofsson. Andreas is the founder of Adaptiva. So he's the one who designed, um, he's the one who designed, um, uh, the parallel board, and what it, what Uppsala University managed to do was actually to get Erlang running on the Epiphany chip. So what you were able to do is, you know, e you know, coprocessors are, are, are fairly tricky to program, and you need to access each coprocessor individually. So they won't communicate with each other. It's it's the way they're built. So you're supposed to basically put computes there. And you know what they were able to do in, in, in a uh, thesis project at Uppsala University is go in and spawn Erlang lightweight processes one per uh, one per core on the Epiphany chip. And so I mean it's hard to visualize this stuff, but you know to tackle these new architectures, this complexity, which is coming in, in the hardware we'll be using, you need a new mindset. You know you need the technologies which will self-discover underlying architectures and actually going in and adapt the code to them. Um, I don't know if you saw the tweet from uh, the head of WhatsApp, but just thanks to the heroic efforts of, um, of the OTP team, all WhatsApp had to do was take and upgrade the version of the Beam they're using, enable the JIT compiler, and they were able to reduce the amount of hardware they need by 30%. Now, WhatsApp have, has tens of thousands of servers. Just imagine what a 30% decrease in, com in, in, in computing power uh, does for the environment, let alone yeah, for, for Mark Zuckerberg's pockets, but yeah, just for the environment itself. So uh, it, it's, um, and, and in our lifetime, I'm fairly convinced, uh, you know, we'll be seeing chips with a million cores on them. And these are cores where you know you've got a chip with a million cores on them. Uh, Andreas Ulfsson, by the way, at Adaptiva, um, he designed a chip with a thousand and twenty-four cores. A single person actually designed the chip with a thousand and twenty-four cores, which actually rumors have it went into production with their customers. So you've got a chip with a million cores. The cores will fail. The cores themselves will fail. And if you think of it, with, if you're dealing with processes with immutable state, dealing with a core failing is the same as if you're programming error or Elixir and dealing with a process failing. It's exactly the same business logic and you deal with the two in exactly the same way. Yeah, so how does all of this hang together? 
we've got immutability. So the property of immutability, which comes from functional programming, this gives us a concurrency model based on immutable state. Now, as soon as we've got processes which don't share memory, it doesn't really matter where we locate this, these processes. We could put them on two separate cores. We could put them on two separate um, processors on the same machine. Or we could put them on two separate machines, two separate processors on two separate machines. It doesn't really matter anymore. And that by default gives us distribution. Now, as soon as we've got distribution, add multi-core to the mix, we get parallelism because we actually place two processes running at the same time on two separate cores. That's what the beam does for you. So the beam will have a thread for every core. It will have a scheduler for every core and it will schedule everything for you. Once you've done that, once you've got that and you've got distribution, you've got scalability and reliability because you distribute uh, your data for scale. All of a sudden, if you've got two computers, you, know, you, can, scale, you can start scaling your system. Four computers, 16, 32, you, know, you keep on increasing the computing power you have, that's how you get scale. And so what you, and to do that, you need to distribute your state. But what you also can do with distribution is replicate your state. So copy it, have at least two copies of it um, for availability and reliability. Am I making sense? And, and, and this is why, you know, Joe Armstrong, you know, kept on saying, uh, kept on saying that, yeah, use Erlang and your system will scale, it will never fail. Uh, he never told us why, but he kept on saying it. And, and uh, I, I was writing a, a, you know, my second book, Designing for Scalability. And that's when I finally went in and realized it. Um, you know, and I realized that concurrency based on immutable state together with distribution gave us scalability and availability. And if you go in and search on YouTube, there's actually Uh, can you can you still hear me? Yes. Um... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there, there was. Um, yeah. And this is where. Um, so this is where you. Um, th th this is where it actually yeah uh, starts starts start, starts um, making sense. So you know, and, and all of the scalability and reliability, you need to go in and address this in your architecture and your business logic from the one. It's not something you can bolt on as an afterthought. It's always about a consistency. Uh, it's about trade-offs between the consistency and the availability of the system. So, because the consistency and availability of the system depends on how you copy and, uh, and, and share your data across multiple computers. And once I'd figured this out, you know, I was fortunate enough to go in and get Joe Armstrong, Tony Hoare, and Carl Hewitt in, in the same room. I think the year was 2018. And, I, and I met, we managed to get them on, on an interview. And you can find it. If you search on talk concurrency on YouTube, you can actually find the, the, full, the, the complete panel discussion. And I, I went in and asked, uh, you know, Joe Armstrong, you know, what problem were you trying to solve when, um, you know, when you, you know, you know, when, when you, you know, co-invented, um, you know, airline style concurrency? And his answer was, well, I was trying to figure out how to make programs full tolerant. I asked Carl Hewitt, uh, you know, what were you trying to solve when you invented the actor model? So the actor model is a concurrency model very similar to airlines one but you know you've got actors uh, actors communicate with asynchronous message passing and his response was oh i was trying to figure out how to program distributed systems and then i had tony hoare uh, who was there and um 
you know, and I asked him, you know, what problem were you trying to solve when you invented concurrent sequential processes, so CSP? And his answer was, oh, I was trying to figure out how to program transputers, which is basically a multi-core systems of, you know, from the 70s and 80s. Yeah, you know, these answers just blew me away. I wasn't expecting them. I should have, uh, but I wasn't expecting them. But so, you know, what we had is Carl Hewitt was figuring out distribution. Uh, Tony Hall was figuring out parallelism. And uh, Joe, Mike, Robert were, you know, trying to figure out reliability. And all hanging together, you know, everyone, you know, trying to solve a problem and coming up with very, very similar solutions to one another, but doing so fairly independently of each other. Um, Tony Hoare and, and, and Carl Hewitt knew of each other and knew of each other's work. Um, but yeah, I don't think back then they realized, um, you know, what, what they were onto. As always, yeah, if you've got any questions, you know, feel free to put them into the chat and then we can take it from there. Um, and you know, just quickly you know, to, to, to start wrapping up, uh, one of the things you need to think about is that the more components you add in your distributed system, the more likely you know, the risk of failure. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, with a mutable state, however, you know, I think the beauty of it, and, and, and I mentioned it earlier, handling of failure on a single machine or a single node, or even a core failing is handled in the exact same way as if you got a process failing. How many of you have worried about losing a computer uh, you know, in the systems you, you've gone live with? Well, you shouldn't, you know, Harry is, Harry, you're, you're worried, but are you worried about losing a process? You've got a supervisor and you lose a process. Does that worry you as much? No, it doesn't. So spot on, Harry. So the, the thing is, when you're dealing with these distributed systems, losing a process should be, you know, handled in exactly the same way as using a, losing a whole node or losing a core, or even having a network partition. Because you know you've got a process on the other end, which will then deal, have to deal with it. The only difference is that you know when you lose a process. You know, within a, within a node, you've got a process in that same node dealing with it. It's a supervisor. You lose a process, or you lose it on another machine, or you lose another machine. You still need a process on a separate machine, which will uh, which will go in and take care of that for you. Is that does that make sense? So, um, now. If we look at that, so um, so so we basically see it as layering. You know, we've got the process which can crash, the virtual machine, you know, the, the supervision tree can crash, the application can crash, the VM can crash, the container in which everything's running can crash, the machine running the container can fail, and your network connectivity can, can go down. And using this programming model, what it allows you to do is just abstract away from failure and handle these error cases in exactly the same way as you're handling a process terminating. So it really simplifies the whole solution to it. Yeah. So what does the future hold for us? Um, I, you know, this is a tweet from the future. It's uh, actually not that far away. I think the future is soon here. Uh, but yeah, in my view, I think probably Kokag, uh, Idris might have the answer. You know, you've got affine types, which lead to linear types, which lead to session types, and which in turn leads to dependent types. And, uh, and yeah, these dependent types will lead to modular and temporal logic. And uh, now I think you'll have to wait another few years um, you know, to discover what all of this is about. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a tweet from the future um, you know, to, to actually stop and think and ponder about it. But what all of this does is, you know, what all of this research is doing right now 
is helping us improve the reliability across distributed systems. At least that's the end goal. And so, you know, I think I'll wrap up this talk um, yeah, and open for questions by leaving you with a really appropriate quote from Joel Spolsky, which is, you know, programming consists of over overcoming two things, accidental difficulties. So those are things which are difficult because you're not using the right programming tools and things which are actually difficult, which you know, no programming tool or language is going to solve. These are, you know, you know the, the, the actual difficulties are the difficulties you need to use your brain to go in and solve. And, you know, if you think of it, you know, the future programming is functional, you know, be it scaling on multi-core architectures or in, distri in distributed environments. And this goes everywhere, you know, from embedded devices all the way up to supercomputers. Uh, you might not be using functional programming language on a day-to-day -day basis, but, you know, what I keep on saying and telling everyone is actually going in and using the paradigms and using the programming models will make you a much, much better programmer. So as for once, this is the revenge, not of the nerds, but of the functional programmers themselves. Um, you know, it has taken me, you know, personally 20 years of professional experience and documenting all of this knowledge you know, to figure out, you know, the positives of how functional programming has happened to impact Erlang and Elixir and, you know, and today a lot of other programming languages around it. And realize how it's actually influencing us on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, sadly enough, it has taken the industry much, much longer. But you know, with uptakes such as Elixir and Phoenix, which are showcasing the power of Erlang and the Beam in your verticals and all of the world around ACTA, you know, which is happening, I think we're slowly, slowly getting there. So uh, you know, hopefully, you know, it won't take you 20 years now to realize why you know, you're telling everyone that Elixir is both scalable and reliable. So, Let's open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. Yay. Thank you, Francesco. That was a really, really good session. Um, so let me hand it over to Frank. Uh, there's a couple of questions on the Slido link. So before we open it up for people to unmute and ask, I guess we can ask those first. What do you think? So I, I can't see. Am I able to see the questions? Uh, yeah, oh, sure, you can actually. Let me just repost this little link. Okay. Yes, you should be able to oh, see oh, them. Oh, I see them. I see them right there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, you should be able to see the questions. And we can also right. let the, uh, the askers of the questions ask, ask them if they are okay yes. with that. Yeah. So, uh, Great. So the, all the questions are anonymous. Is it safe to say concurrence's main bragging point is independence? Who, who asked that question? It, you want to unmute yourself. Are you still here? Okay, we're being shy. So, okay. The question is, is it safe to say concurrence's main bragging point is independence? Your process is running autonomously can crash without affecting any other. This is one of the many bragging points. I think you know the, the, the real bragging point is that you've got processes. Processes do not share memory. You know, that, that's, and, and that's probably what, what you mean by independence. And processes communicate with each other through asynchronous message passing. I've not talked about asynchronous message passing, but asynchronous message passing is critical when you're dealing with distributed systems. Because what you do is, because the message passing is asynchronous, you, you'll assume, and not instantaneous, not synchronous, you'll assume that you, know, you can have latency. And the only difference between having two processors on the same machine or two processors on separate machines is when they communicate, uh, latency will be higher. So if you're dealing with soft real-time systems, then that should, be, you know, that should be fine and that should be acceptable. So it's, yeah. And then you're saying processes are running autonomously and can crash without affecting each other you might have processes which are dependent on each other. And that's why we've got supervision trees to handle that. So, you know, if a process terminates, the supervisor will decide if there are other processes which are dependent on this particular process and it will go in and terminate themselves and restart them. But it's all, again, taken away from the hands of the developer, which is what's really important and handled in a standardized way. So it stops the developer from actually going in and trying to write defensive programming. And defensive coding. Hope that was answered okay. 
So the second question is, let it crash philosophy is one of the commonly used phrase. When is it best to explicitly, res uh, explicitly rescue error and catch than to let it crash? So this very much depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, let it crash, I think you should use when you do not know what the bug is going to be. Uh, and when you don't know what the bug is going to be, and when you do not know what, um, you know, and if your state is corrupt and you don't know, you know, how to adjust from your corrupt state, by letting it crash, you clear the state. Um, if you do know how to correct everything, yes, then you should catch the error and fix it. But if you're catching the error and fixing it, you know what the error is going to be in the first place. So how, how can you actually fix it? So if you if you do know, great, you know that that's when you should catch them and, and handle them. But it's not always obvious. So you need to ask yourselves as a programmer, you know, which approach to take. Usually, you know, where, when do I use catch is when there's user input, which might be incorrect. And so um, you know, what we do is you know, we do a try catch, trying to parse it. And if there's an error, you know, which you know, when, when you're trying to parse the user input, you just think of the positive case. And if there's an incorrect case, you 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 raise an exception. You might want to catch it and then continue saying, "Oh, there was a, an error with your user input." You check it out and try again, and maybe you try to help with, with the details. So uh, another question about Rust: Is there anyone who wants to ask it? Anyone who wants to own up and ask for it? Yes, go ahead, Harry. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was me. So uh, yeah. just had a question about the future of uh, Rust and Elixir. So do you think it will become more mainstream or it's only for high scale kind of Discord type uh, companies? Like So I always say use the right tool for the job. And be very well aware that it's not always Erlang and it's not always Elixir. And so what you need to ask yourself is, you know, and, and I think I love what what's happening with Rust. Um, I, it's, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, I, I think it's becoming the new C, basically. You need to write super fast code, you know, you'll go down the Rust route these days. And, um, but, at the same time, you need to be aware that as soon as you add another component, another moving component, you're adding complexity. As soon as you add complexity, you add the risk of failure. So, you know, it, it's, um, you know, what I'm actually seeing out there is a lot of VMs being written in Rust, uh, 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 beam, you know, beam clones uh, being written in Rust. That's a new language, you know, for writing VMs. I'm also seeing, um, you know, huge progress being made on the B. So just by, you know, just with a JIT compiler, 30% increase in throughput. With a 30% increase in throughput, some people will say, do we actually still need Rust? And if the answer is yes, yeah, then, then yeah, go in, use it with NIFS. Uh, and the answer, answer is, mm, we might get away by, you know, by not doing it, then it might make sense. You know, to add a few more cores or an extra machine and, and scale that way. So it, 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 it completely depends on your application and if you're able to handle the, the extra complexity and uncertainty. Yeah. So what makes the beam not so good for number crunching? Who asked that question? Anyone yeah, want to ask it? Yeah, it's actually me. Uh, I'm the one who asked that question. I've had it not not once, not twice. Yeah. Yeah, so, but the beam the beam is good for all this, but not for number crunching. And if yeah. you need to do number crunching, you need to use another tool for this. Yeah, so cool. uh, yeah, I'm actually wondering, is it a design uh, yes. quote unquote problem? So, uh, or... I wish Robert mm -hmm. Birding, so Erlen Coimenta just ran away and disappeared. Um yeah, but you know, I think uh, he would have been perfect to answer this. Now, the reason for this is it's not good for number crunching because again, number crunching was never something which was relevant to telecoms. 
That's one of the reasons. And so, you know, they never really thought much about it. And still today, it's not relevant to telecoms. Um, the, the, the foundation has, you know, funded some work to improve floating point operations uh, and, and IO on floating points, but, you know, with, with different algorithms. But um, when it comes to number crunch, I think, you know, one of the biggest problem is dynamic typing of the language. So, uh, you know, that slows down. You need to do type checks every single time you do operations. So it's the way it's built. Uh, and I think you're know, comparing it to uh, Erjang. So Erjang was Erlang running on the JVM. You know, they benchmarked floating point operations. And if I remember correctly, floating point operations on Erjang, in Erlang, on Erjang, uh, were something like a thousand times faster than on the beam. And it's uh, yeah, and and it's it's because a it's not been optimized. I'm sure there's a lot of areas for optimizations, but b because you know optimizing is not a priority for the developers uh, because it's not something which is critical to telecom or soft real time systems. You know, so if you use number crunching, use Rust, you see, or or even use Scala and Java, which are yeah, which are really optimized not for scale, but for speed. Yeah. What do you think will come first? Million core boards or next generation of computers? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, yeah, I think we need to ask this question to Andreas Olofsson at Adaptiva. Uh, he's currently now, uh, he's got a new company and they're basically designing silicon on demand. So it, it's a really exciting thing that they're working on. Does Alexi build on the benefit from all of the distributed systems problem solutions that Erlang pioneered? Um, answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, uh, that that's really what I love about it, you know, uh, and it's also one of the things, you know, what, one of, yeah, so Alex builds on all of that. Um, we see, you know, what you can do with Erlang, you can also do in Elixir. What you can do in Elixir, in many cases, you can also do in Erlang. And it, it's, uh, I'm really, really glad, I think, that a lot of that was not lost. You know, sometimes you lose things when you implement new languages. And... You know, this was not lost in this particular case. So is there a market for mid-level Elixir developers looking for work? It seems that a lot of remote jobs are only looking for senior Elixir developers. Uh, who answered that question? Is it you, Natalia? No, no, it was Harry. <laughs> I'm joking, Natalia. Uh, so yeah, Harry asked for that question. There's a huge market uh, for mid-level Elixir developers, huge. Um, there's also a huge market for developers who want to work with Elixir but have no experience. Because you know, companies are struggling to find good Elixir developers. And uh, you know, the, the, the point is you, you do not go in and recruit an Elixir developer. You go in and recruit a good programmer. And Elixir is something you know, a good programmer should be able to pick up fairly quickly. So um, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I really kind of encourage you to keep on looking and, uh, yeah, and keep on applying. Uh, the Airline Ecosystem Foundation will itself be, uh, you know, putting in place a job board very soon with the exact intent of connecting people who want to, to work with Elixir, with companies to dealing with Elixir, but also Erlang for that matter, because we had exactly the same problem in Erlang. We had companies saying, oh, we can't recruit, we can't recruit. And then we had developers saying, oh, you know, I can't find jobs, I can't find jobs. And, uh, yeah, but there was no one place you know, to bring them in, you know, bang their heads against each other and say, speak to each other <laughs> instead of complaining. What are the common issues people have when coming to functional distributed concurrent systems that have you, that, that uh, you've been dealing with? Um, I think most of the challenges I would say is, you know, at least which I'm seeing is people not putting on the computer science hat. Uh, distributed systems are complex, uh, they're hard, and yeah, a lot of things can go wrong. And what I would personally like to do, and I think Natalia here has been involved, 
is basically creating an OTP. So what OTP does is it abstracts concurrence and everything which can go wrong with concurrent programming, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's all of these common issues you're describing are, um, are all of these common issues which you're describing are actually written in, you know, are, are actually, um, um, all of these common issues are usually handled in OTP. But we do not still today have an OTP for distributed programming, where we put in all of the common patterns into one place, in this, and all of the, handle all of the things which can go wrong in one single place. And that's because everyone will do some part of it, but they will do it differently. Mm -hmm. I just, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you still have time to the remaining questions? Very or quickly, very quickly, um, very quickly. So, um, yeah, is Elixir a good tool for developing a fintech company as compared to using JVM languages? Absolutely. Uh, five minutes on Google uh, will make you realize how many banks uh, and uh, payment gateways, credit card companies are using both Erlang and Elixir uh, for, to do that. Uh, with immutability, does it mean we create different memories with the same variable name? Yes, it does. Um, because your know, variable names are local to the process itself. Do you prefer using writing Erlang or Elixir and why? So I am not writing as much code as I should these days, unfortunately, but very much believe that you know, both Erlang and Elixir still have their own strengths and there's still place for both. Uh, and usually um, you know, if, if when, when to decide, you know, do I use Erlang or do I use Elixir? Well, if it's infrastructure, if it's things which you know, get run and used many, many times, uh, if it's APIs, if it's infrastructure. So it, think of abstract code, which be, is reused from one project to another. Then you know, I prefer Erlang because it's simpler and it's, it's um, cleaner and you don't have macros. But if you need to do APIs, front ends, uh, and protocols, then it makes sense to use Elixir. So you know, it, it's always finding you know, the strengths of each respective language and you know, what were the users trying to solve. So a FinTech company we've answered, are any companies we request to pay use cases implementation using Erlang or Elixir? I don't understand the question. Uh, any company would request to pay use case implementation using Erlang or Elixir. I'm not quite sure what this question means. Yeah, great. So I think that's it for the questions. Yeah. I get it. Um, anyone else? Sorry. Yeah. There's one extra question by Alfonso from the chat. Yes. Oh, sorry. Is uh -huh. It was yeah, sorry. in the slide. Yeah. Oh, uh, he, he's, it's answered. Has it been answered, Alfonso? Yeah, was well, the okay. same from the slide. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, well, great. thank you so um, much. Sorry, there's probably a lag on my network. Yeah, thank you, Francesco. Can you guys hear thank me? Thank you so much. Yes, Getty, we can hear you. We also hear the birds in the oh, background. It's beautiful. <laughs> All right. Um, let me just wind this up really fast. Um, thank you so much, uh, Francesco. It was a really good session. We really appreciate um, the Elixir community and everyone here. Pretty sure we had a really great time, learned a few things that we didn't know prior. Um, if you have any questions or you would like to just reach out to Francesco later on, I'll just post his Twitter handle here where you can reach out to him and he's very av available, sorry, to answer all your questions. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you so much, Francesco. See you on the next one. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.